My starting point tonight is that contemporary cities are full of media and new sorts of mediated experiences are increasingly shaping urban social life. This isn't really the way that people imagined it in the 1980s when we thought about the internet as cyberspace, as some kind of separate world, a parallel dimension to embodied physical space. People thought that the rise of online interaction would mean that everyone would become more physically isolated from each other, would be shut away in their own home. The French architecture and media theorist Paul Virilio talked about a new level of sedentarization, of people becoming sedentary, of domestic incarceration. Get it really close, okay. Yes, this can occur, and it can even be extreme in some instances. But since the 1980s, we've also seen media become part of the city in new ways. We've seen screens of all shapes and sizes be embedded in urban spaces, particularly since the 2000s when LED became a support for video. We've seen massive development of mobile devices, new forms of projection, computer-controlled lighting, and particularly new developments around how we watch media in public space. That image on the top right, it's a crowd watching a football match, but they're not watching the live match, they're watching it on the screen in a public space in the UK. These kinds of developments create new challenges, new conditions for urban inhabitation, new challenges for, for planners, for designers, and for publics. That's what I want to talk about this evening. I'm going to argue that we need to reassess how we're deploying pervasive digital media as urban infrastructure. I think the digitization of cities has the real potential to create a new type of city, but I don't think we've given enough thought to how it's happening or what we want as the final outcome. Instead, we've allowed some developments to accumulate in a fairly ad hoc way. Others, notably the idea of the smart city, has become part of a much more explicit discourse I'll suggest this agenda can be useful in some ways. I mean, who doesn't want their city to be smart? But I think it is limited at present and potentially reductive. I'm going to argue if we want to make the fullest use of the possibilities of digital media, we should put communication at the center of how we're thinking about and how we're designing mediated cities. And communication's fundamentally about exchange. It's about how complex processes of creative interchange define our identities, our relation, our sense of self, our relations to others through practices of signification, dialogue, interpretation. If we put communication at the center of how we're thinking about the city, we have to do two things. Think about how we design spaces that maximize the opportunities for rich communicative interactions in the context of networked public spaces and then think about some of the unintended consequences that might be arising. And for me, that's particularly about how contemporary cities become an environment in which a lot of data can be captured, particularly data about how we're moving around the city. Okay, let's step back a little. There's a long history of mediated behavior in cities and different media platforms. In a book I wrote a number of years ago called The Media City, I traced the way that various technological media, such as photography, cinema, electric lighting, television, had all shaped modern architecture and urban life. And this was happening since the 19th century. I argued that the spatial experience in modernity was increasingly co-constituted by growing interplay between architecture and media it becomes feasible to think about the modern city as a media architecture complex. This has been happening across the 20th century. But I think it's only become dominant and therefore more readily identifiable in recent years. And this is intimately connected to the digitization of media, the deployment of digital media as urban infrastructure. What's different about digital media? Digitization creates the condition for the growing convergence between previously separate sectors, keep it drinking, such as broadcasting, telecommunications, and computing. When all kinds of media become computational, 
and networked, communication changes significantly. Computational media like smartphones, they're not just about displaying content like an old TV set. They're generative, they can make new content. When computational media are linked by wired and wireless networks, the communication architecture changes fundamentally. So those older networks that were more centralised, like broadcast television, start to be displaced by new practices, many-to-many, decentralised, distributed communication practices. In my book, Geomedia, I wanted to think more closely about how this new condition impacts on public space and public culture. So Geomedia is the term I chose to describe the new spatialisation of media in the city and the way in which new mediated interactions shape our experience of place. I argue the condition of geomedia emerges at the nexus of three trajectories. Ubiquity, positionality, real time. Just want to unfold, it, unfold each of them briefly. If we think about the older media paradigm, it can be described at least in retrospect in terms of scarcity and fixity. So there were fewer outlets and you had to go to particular places if you wanted to watch something or be connected or listen to something. You had to, you know, the telephone was wired into a wall. Televisions were primarily in people's living rooms. Computers were tethered to office desks. This has changed decisively in the present. Sorry, I won't go there. Mobile devices, embedded media platforms, coupled to extended and enhanced digital networks, recreate the, recreate the contemporary city as a space in which connection is seemingly available anywhere, anytime. There's practical limits to this. They're technical, they're cultural, they're commercial. But the point is our expectations about media access has changed. And this is changing our social behaviour in all kinds of ways. This is the new normal for the city. The second broad trajectory is positionality and the enhanced, ro in the enhanced role of location in the operation of contemporary media platforms. This has got two aspects to it. One is the way in which GPS systems have been embedded in mobile media devices, particularly since around the year 2000. So it's a relatively recent development. Really flourishes following the release of the iPhone in 2007. GPS enables devices to become location sensitive, location aware. The other side of this development is the rapid growth of geotagged information. So increasingly in the digital domain, all information is being organised with reference to place. You know, Google search, for instance, has had the default setting of place filtering um, since about 2010. Combining geotag data with location-aware devices means we're increasingly able to access context-specific information while we're moving through the city. This offers all sorts of new possibilities for negotiating urban life. Mapping, access to recommendation services, location-based advertising, but it also comes at a cost. This, the other side of positionality is the growing capacity to track and trace individuals with increasing precision and granularity. The location awareness of digital media means a wide range of social practices are drawn into new commercial and political logics that are enacted across urban space. Malcolm McCulloch talks about the city plan becoming a living surface with the individual with a mobile device as a cursor. The third factor defining geomedia is what I call real-time. To understand this, you've got to think about how real-time today differs from, say, the era of broadcast television or of radio. Of course, they enabled forms of instantaneous connection across um, space and time. Through the 20th century, you had these very different forms of social simultaneity that radio and television could orchestrate. But these were very centralised forms. What's different in the present is the capacity for these distributed communication networks to enable that kind of instantaneous connection between multiple different actors. I think we can see this really clearly in some of the recent events like the protest movements that happened in the Arab Spring or this is you know, an image of Tahir Square in 2011. 
or the various Occupy movements that included the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong in 2013. All these groups used mobile and social media platforms in really distinctive ways to organise the way in which they were gathering together in public space. It's important to be careful here. This isn't about saying that these were sort of Facebook or Twitter revolutions, as some commentators did about the Arab Spring. They were quite hasty to do that. You can't reduce the complications of these diverse political struggles to some kind of technology-led liberation. What I'm pointing to is this historical threshold that mobile digital media platforms bring. They alter one of the long-standing historical constraints on public assembly, on how you can mobilise a lot of people rapidly. This used to be the prerogative of highly centralised organisations like the military or the police. Network digital media mean that a much wider range of social actors are able to do exactly that kind of organisation. And this also shifts how we represent these kinds of events. We used to have to depend on the official media for representation. If you look at this image from the Umbrella Revolution in Hong Kong, I mean, it looks a little bit like a rock concert. They're all holding up their phones, got their lights on. But what are they holding up? They're holding up networked connectivity, the way in which they can actually communicate with each other in order to move through the city, to gather together, to assemble. Events like the Umbrella Movement were not simply reported on by media professionals, but were witnessed from inside by the participants who distributed their own reports via websites, blogs, social media, online video. This doesn't change all the power relations. Mainstream media is still enormously important. That protest movement wasn't eventually successful. What it is important to recognise is that social encounters of all kinds of different scales, from a few friends trying to organise to meet together to a large assembly like this, a very large scale assembly, can now be mediated in various ways, including by those participating in them. And the real-time aspect of this means that the event is shaped by this kind of recursive modulation where people are communicating with each other even while they're taking part in the event. These kinds of feedback systems change how we engage with the city as a social environment and they change how we engage with the people around us. And I'm going to shift tack and talk about how this has been concretised along one particular urban future. Because, of course, the digital instrumentation of the city has coincided with the rise of the smart city as a paradigm for urban futures. In a technical sense, smart city operations can be defined by the use of multiple, large-scale, varied data sets to guide planning interventions in domains such as urban transport, resource use and the like. It's only relatively recently when the cost of networking sensors, data storage, analytics, data retrieval have all become lower in cost by orders of magnitude, that it's become feasible to collect data about all kinds of urban systems and behaviour. So you can collect data about water use or power use, but also about people movement. The goal now is to process and apply this data potentially in real time, so as to act on those same systems and behaviours. And under this paradigm, we've seen schemes developed in cities all around the world to harness data in order to contribute to resolving different urban challenges. For example, decreasing road congestion by better coordinating the movement of um, millions of private vehicles or implementing forms of smart parking or developing smart lighting schemes and so on. Lots of these individual projects have real merit to them. What I'm interested in questioning here is the broader overall logic and I'm asking whether the orientation and the settings of the current smart city agenda is making the best possible use of digital infrastructure. The sociologist Saskia Sassen has argued strongly that current smart city approaches are too dependent on top-down managerial approaches. 
implemented through developments such as central control rooms. A lot of people would have seen this, you know, the IBM control room developed for the um, city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, which integrates data from more than 30 government agencies in a single organisation. Sasson writes that she thinks such approaches are unlikely to have long-term value because they ignore the role that a city's inhabitants, the citizens of the city, can and in fact need to play in any large-scale process of so social and cultural change. So what she's saying is if you're interested in changing people's behaviour, whether it's about how they move around the city or how they use energy or how they treat the urban environment, gathering data might be part of the process but it's not enough on its own. You need to also have mechanisms to motivate people to create shared understanding so that they actually are engaged in what the change is going to take place. And for this reason, Sasson has also criticised the preference in many smart city programs for using closed technical systems, so-called black boxes, where the workings of the system remains largely invisible to the citizens. And it's interesting to understand why the technologies are developed in this way. I mean, a number of writers have pointed this out, that the smart city actually doesn't come out of urbanism. It comes out of technology vendors. It's companies like IBM or Samsung or Siemens who have an interest in selling the technology. There's a nice quote from the Danish urbanist Jan Giel where he questions whether smart is actually about improving urban amenity or about selling something. I think this vendor-driven history of smart city as a concept brings some other limitations. There's a fairly narrow sense of who the important stakeholders are. The authorities, technology companies, maybe the urban planners, but not often the public. While there's a rhetoric of transparency, this isn't always carried through. Too frequently you see that data access is asymmetrical. By that I mean that citizens provide data, often through your own mobile device, it can be aggregated, but you only get access selectively to process data, not to the raw data. And finally, I think smart city programs tend to be too reliant on values like optimization and efficiency. Cities have lots of administrative systems, lots of technical systems, but they shouldn't be reduced to the functioning of those systems. Values like optimization and efficiency, I think, are okay for monitoring something like energy use or water use, but they're poor as values for understanding the conditions in which civic life and public sociability might flourish. It's on this basis that Sasson advocates what she calls an open source city agenda. Open source urbanism. By this she means cities need to deploy open source thinking not only at a technical level, but at a cultural level. This means designing and deploying systems that are less about command and control from above, and more about dialogue from citizens to and from the city. She's saying, think about the multiple ways citizens can talk back to the city and the city can talk back to people. For Sasson, she's saying cities need to provide lots of information about how they work to their citizens, so it's about transparency, but also provide avenues for citizens to talk back to the city. I think she's on the right track, but I think you can extend the point even further. Urban sociability flourishes when cities are also able to provide rich opportunities for inhabitants to communicate with each other. Peer-to-peer -peer communication between citizens in the city. Developing new forms of public communication, I think, can contribute to improving a range of urban outcomes, and this is often in unforeseen ways. I'll give you a really simple example of what I mean. I don't know how well that slide's going to show up, but several years ago, the city of Melbourne, where I live, developed a project called Urban Forest. This involved giving an email address, a separate email address, to every of the 70,000 trees within the city. And that's actually a graphic showing each tree mapped out against the central Melbourne streetscape.
and it has different colours showing the health of the tree, sort of the greener they are, the healthier they are, the longer their life expectancy is. The idea behind the project was that members of the public could use the email address to report back if, say, a branch fell off the tree or if the tree was in trouble and needed some help. Unexpectedly, though, people started doing other things with the email addresses. They started writing messages to the trees. They started expressing affection, gratitude, attachment, concern for the trees. It's only when a council officer released some of the emails to the media that people started to become aware this wasn't an individual concern, it was a shared concern. The story ended up being reported all over the world. This is a cutting from the US magazine, The Atlantic, and it talks about people writing love letters to trees. The reporting, of course, inspired more and more messages. The city still gets thousands of emails now including from people from other countries about the trees. Why is this significant? Because if this project had stayed as a classic smart city project where you report back to the city, this level of public affect, of public shared emotion, would have remained invisible. Instead, when the emotional connection that people had to the tree became public, Everybody could recognise that it was a shared concern and then it eventually became the basis for networks of local residents mobilising to care for trees in their areas. So it led to this outcome where people started to do things together to care for the trees. There's several lessons here for what I want to call a communicative city approach to networked public space. First thing, when you're designing a digital system, you recall this, it was just a reporting mechanism. Don't just think about it as a mechanism to provide information to citizens or for them to report back to authority. Think about how the architecture of the system, in this case a website, might also now allow people to communicate with each other. Second, this is not just a story about mediated exchange, about emails and news stories but it's also about the way that this resulted in lots of people who didn't previously know each other coming together to act collectively in public space. So this is a process that depends on this feedback loop between communication and action, where people develop an individual sense of attachment to something like a tree, they express that, it becomes public, and it leads to collective action to, to care for the urban environment. These are generative processes, building social capital in the city. Here it's worth recalling why public space is so important for fostering this kind of exchange and for fostering this kind of sense of belonging in a city. Part of it stems from the distinctive living conditions of the modern city. The sociologist George Simmel recognised more than 100 years ago that the modern city involved living among strangers in a new way. In the small town or in the village, if a stranger comes in, they either move on or if they stay, they become assimilated. Everybody knows them. But in a big city, the stranger stays but remains a stranger. So we all get very used to this as a structural condition. We dwell among most people we don't know personally. This puts a lot of pressure on traditional forms of social bonding. And I think this condition has become even more pronounced in the 21st century. The history of mass migration, the more jagged mobilities of the present, forms of temporary inhabitation, serial migration and so on. So they're all creating these pressures on urban sociability. In his book Together, the sociologist Richard Sennett argues that the sort of complex societies engendered in contemporary cities, which are characterised by high degrees of diversity and mobility, require novel forms of social cooperation. And I quote, a de demanding and difficult kind of cooperation that tries to join people who have separate or conflicting interests, who do not feel good about each other, who are unequal, or who simply don't understand each other. 
critically for Senate, this kind of social cooperation, or what he calls public civility, is not a matter of ethics. It's not a matter of ethical intent. It's not about wanting to do the right thing. He says, actually, this is a skill, and a skill derived from experience. In other words, if we want to have social cooperation, we've got to learn how to do it. We've got to practice it. We've got to have opportunities to nurture it, to explore it, to practice it within the city. And the most important part of the city for practicing the skill of social cooperation is public space. And that's the great insight of the urbanist Jane Jacobs, understanding the importance of public space for sustaining various forms of informal or relatively unplanned social interaction. So public space is not necessarily a space of harmony. In fact, it's often a space of friction. But Jacob's point was that successful public spaces are able to sustain what she called virtuous cycles of interaction between strangers. In this way, they contribute to the stock of experience that Senate sees as essential. They help us to develop our sense of public sociability. This leads us to a really key question for the 21st century. Does public space still function in the same way that it did when Jacobs began her work in the 1950s? You think one of the key issues cities have faced in the second half of the 21st century is the impact of automobiles, of cars on urban public space. And it's largely through the advocacy of those such as Jane Jacobs and Jan Gill that cities around the world, including Moscow, have begun to attempt to address the excesses of automobility. Policies to open up sidewalks to facilitate walking, bicycling, pedestrian activity. The situation's by no means perfect. My city, Melbourne, has been doing the same thing for about 25 years. It's better than it used to be. Today, I think one of the questions we need to ask is whether the impact of digital media on public space might be the 21st century equivalent of the automobile. Paul Virilio famously proclaimed that every new technology is the invention of a new accident. We can see this really clearly with mobile devices. Every time you're walking down the street, you'll see someone walking along with their phone, you're on your bicycle, they don't see you. They're distracted. This really came to a head a couple of years ago when Pokemon Go was so popular, and people all around the world were crossing streets without looking whether there was traffic. And this has led to some interest in designing new kinds of urban infrastructure to reflect these different patterns of attention. This is an experimental street light system in Melbourne, so it's on the ground, so that if you're walking along looking at your phone, you'll actually see whether the light's red or green. I think this is interesting development, but I also think it risks being a superficial response to the full impact of how digital media is changing our patterns of urban life. My question is, what if the real accident of pervasive media is not our safety and traffic, but our public sociability? Urban media have historically had two main trajectories. One is based on spectacle, symbolized by the dominance of commercial communication in the public landscape. Times Square in New York, in Manhattan, goes from this in the mid-1970s to this. Most of that public landscape is dominated by commercial imagery, commercial messaging. I think the other trajectory, which is more recent, is what might be called telecocooning. It's dependent on that interaction with mobile devices. And everybody would have seen pictures like this, where people are in public, but they're not together. They're in public, but they're engrossed in doing something on their personal device. So if spectacle leads us often to ignore the city around us like a kind of white noise, telecocooning tele means we risk sealing ourselves off from interactions with other people. 
We communicate, but we're only with the people we already know. We use the mobile device as a way of filtering our interactions with the city. If we do this too much, the risk is we might live in spatial versions of what media theorists call filter bubbles. Self-referential worlds that aren't disturbed by unplanned encounters. It's one thing to be critical about these tendencies, but unless we also begin to reimagine how that future of network public space might look, things are unlikely to change. However, and I think this is interesting, if we do start to think about using this infrastructure differently, all kinds of possibilities emerge. If we start thinking about how we might use urban digital infrastructure to support public dialogue, there's many, many opportunities. One area that I've been interested in for some time now is urban screens. Cities around the world have been embedding digital screens and media facades into their environment for at least two decades. And I think all these screens are really interesting because they have that potential to reach beyond a private conversation to address a collective audience who are assembled together. But mostly, the scale of these screens dwarfs people, and like these ones you know, from the Pudong area in Shanghai, they're often used as branding, even at the city level. Our research unit's been involved in a number of experiments using a large screen in the centre of Melbourne as a platform for public communication. In other words, communication that can be used by the public. Our specific interest was how we might enable people in the city, members of the public, to contribute to the content on the screen, and then how this might become an experience that could be shared across distance, potentially connecting up to other cities. We developed a partnership with an art gallery in Seoul, in Korea, and we developed a couple of really simple projects at first. They were just experiments to see how this might work. In one project, this is Federation Square in Melbourne, where a large screen's embedded in the space, and this project's called SMS Origins. And it just asked people, you could send a text message to a number saying where you were born and where your parents were born. And then the software would map on the screen that trajectory. That data could be displayed on screens in both cities. So you could do that in Melbourne or you could do it linking Melbourne with Seoul, as we did in a number of experiments. In another project called Value at Tomorrow City, it was a similar kind of idea. Members of the public could send in a text describing what they thought was the most important value for the future city. And the responses were then organised by the software, like a word cloud. You can see this here in English and in Korean. And the individual responses are identified by the people's phone number. So I think it's really important that the work provides a way that you can see your own expression. If you were doing the mapping project, it would show each individual trajectory being mapped at a time, it would zoom in. But it doesn't remain as an individual expression in isolation, and it's not simply averaged out the way a survey might be. Each of the individual marks that are made by participants stays as part of an evolving network. So I think this is a really important aspect of what digital media can enable. Other projects we did moved away from language-based exchange to explore more embodied forms of interaction. We did a project called Hello. It was simply about how would you say hello to somebody in another city if you didn't speak their language. We worked with choreographers to develop a really simple dance routine. And then the idea was people would teach each other the dance routine using the screens. So you would go into a tent, you would dance with someone in the other city, rehearsing a one or two minute routine together, and then the whole process would be shown on the large screen. So it's quite an intimate project at one level, but it's also quite hilarious because lots of people just did whatever sort of dances they liked and 
there was a lot of humor in it. For instance, these guys walked off the street in Melbourne and then just started dancing with this Korean woman and her daughter. I think there's some interesting lessons we can draw from these kinds of experiments. First thing, they're not about replacing face-to-face -face experience with a substitute, nor are they about simply transcending place through digital connectivity. They're really trying to combine embodied interaction, like us sitting together in this space, with networked affordances. So they're creating a hybrid experience where you're having that physical embodied situated interaction, but at the same time it can be connected through technology to another space. And I think this is what is a real challenge for us in the present city, to understand this hybrid condition of network public space, where older forms of public assembly are intertwined on so many levels with technological mediation. Of course, urban screens are not the only vehicles for generating these kinds of hybrid experiences. Another area that we've been watching and experimenting with over years is light-based art, you know, projection or light installation. And projection work functions on many different registers. It can be decorative, embellishing a building, or using projection mapping to you know, deconstruct it in various ways. This is a projection onto a World Heritage listed building in Melbourne. It can be more activist, more bottom up. This is a very famous image that was produced by the um, artist Christian Wojcicki in 1985. The swash sticker projected onto the South African Embassy in London in Trafalgar Square. Of course, at the height of the apartheid regime while Nelson Mandela was still locked up. Other similar kinds of examples from Occupy New York, the Occupy bat signal projected onto the Ver Verizon building. Laser projection in the protests against President Morsi in Egypt in 2013. And even more recently, projections onto the um, Ambassador Hotel owned by the US President in Washington. Projection can also be used to give the public control. Various projects by the artist Raphael Lozana Hammer have experimented with lighting, computer controlled lighting as a form of publicly controlled infrastructure. This was the first time this project, Vectorial Elevation, was done in the Zocalo Plaza in Mexico City in 2000, and then they repeated it for the Winter Olympics in Vancouver. So the idea is you can either via the internet or via particular installations around the city, you can design a lighting interaction and the lights move in response to individual designs. And this is the most recent version in Hobart in Australia, where you can use like, because this is a port city, you can use like a boat rudder to move the lights around. And lighting can also provide a really interesting kind of occasion for social gathering. Another project that Lozana Hammer did in Melbourne, and this is the slide I opened with, it's a project called Solar Equation. It was done in 2010 in Federation Square in the centre of Melbourne. We have a winter light festival called Light in Winter. It's a solstice festival for the darkest time of the year. And Raphael made a scale model of the sun as a heliostat, so it's tethered like a balloon that's tethered, and then they project onto it solar imagery gathered from NASA, transformed by both public interaction and also by complex algorithms. Another example from Light in Winter, this is an installation designed by Bruce Ramis called the Helix Tree. The lighting is responsive to voice, so people could gather around this and sing to it to change the way in which it illuminated the space. I think these are really distinctive opportunities for a new form of ritual, combining aesthetics and algorithms. This shared experience of standing under an artificial sun or an artificial tree on a winter night. <laughs> 
One of the most moving and profound projection projects I've seen was Christoph Wojcikow's The Investigators from 2016. As you saw with the earlier swash sticker image, Wojcikow has a history of transforming buildings, but also monuments and statues through projection. The Investigators was a projection onto the very famous Goethe Schiller monument in Weimar, Germany. It's a monument to the two most esteemed German writers, and it's been credited with inspiring a cult of the monument across Germany, but also in other countries like America, where there's dozens of these statues. Wojcikow's project involved interviewing refugees who had come to Germany about their experience. The video recordings were then mapped onto the statue's face, allowing these different voices to speak through the statue. They also erected a podium so that members of the public could come and face the statue and ask questions, and then live responses from participants in a nearby studio were projected onto the statues. Why do it like this? Why not just have refugees come and appear in person and have a conversation? One possible answer is that it could be much more confronting for them to do this. But I think a more compelling reason is that Wojciko, the artist, wanted to bring the symbolic dimensions of this statue into play. We need to remember that Schiller was himself a refugee. He was a doctor who had deserted from the army during a time of war. In order to get to Weimar, he had to cross a number of checkpoints. And Goethe protected him in the city when he arrived. Transforming the materiality of the monument using refugee faces and voices is a powerful gesture. It recollects this history in the present and creates the opportunity for a unique form of public testimony. And this is something I think that Wojcikow's practice can teach us. He argues that staging these kinds of communicative acts in symbolic public spaces, the spaces that are important to the history of a city, can contribute to the healing of trauma through processes of public dialogue. OK, I want to bring this talk to a conclusion. 50 years ago, the French sociologist Henri Lefebvre argued that the issue of the right to the city was the crucial issue for modern urbanism. Who was able to appropriate the time and space of the city and to what ends? Today, I think we need to rethink the right to the city in the context of networked cities. How is public sociability being reconfigured by networked public space? I've suggested there are some dominant tendencies, that large-scale spectacle which tends to make you as an individual feel very small in the big city, or the cocooning, the use of mobile devices to create mobile private spaces as we move through the city. The danger is if we withdraw too much from interacting in unplanned ways with the people around us, we get unpracticed at it, we start to be fearful of it. And of course, the smart city that's being implemented around us, a city which is managed, which promises to be safe and secure, but I'm concerned about what kind of social qualities it will have, especially if we don't address the looming problem of digital infrastructure being used for large-scale data capture, creating a condition of mass surveillance, because every time you're traveling through the city using your mobile device, it can map where you're going. To counter these tendencies, I've tried to advocate a communicative city approach. At the risk of being reductive, I've come up with a few final principles, I think, to help us think through the challenge of designing cities that are capable of fostering new forms of public communication. I'll just speak to each of these really briefly. Participation and diversity. We think of public space, in principle, it should be inclusive and open to everyone. And I think we need to extend this ideal of open access to how we think about media infrastructure in public space. When I move around Moscow, I see lots of screens, but they're for advertising. Why can't they be also for public communication?
how might we get a broader range of voices, of content involved in the dialogue within the public space of the city? What's the best model for supporting citizen-created content? Articulating media and architecture, I think this is the really big challenge. How do you join together traditional public spaces with their affordances, the built physical space with the capacities of digital connectivity. I think there's so many examples where this is done badly. But there are examples where there is a more thoughtful articulation of how it might work. The one I've showed you, the screen at Federation Square, I think is quite distinctive in a number of ways. It's embedded in a traditional public space. So it's not high up on a building addressing a road, people in cars or people moving along the street. It's a space people can gather in. And once people can gather there, you've got new communicative opportunities. You can see the reverse shot here. It's sort of a gently sloping amphitheater. And you can get different types of experiences in relation to the screen. And we've seen a number of other developments around Australia trying to deploy screens in similar ways. This is one in an outer Melbourne suburb. I think one of the key issues is the height of the screen. If they get too high, they tend to be alienating to people. Yeah, they're very visible. They're good for advertising or for showing a movie. But for the kind of communication that I'm talking about, they need to be lower to the ground. This is an interesting one, the public media commons in Missouri in the US. Again, placing the screen in the context of a gathering space. And finally, one that's been developed recently, it's a shot from above in Perth, incorporating a digital tower in a public space as well as LED um, covered walkways in the context of an amphitheater. I think the real challenge is how you get those traditional affordances of public space, shelter, informal seating, capacity to look at people, while you're also including the digital media affordances. So there's a lot of experimentation going on in this area. The last two issues I was raising, we control our data. As I said, network public space means that connectivity is more widespread, but it also means that capacity for data collection is being really intensified now. So I think we need to have more transparency about how this happens. Who's collecting the data? What for? What are they doing with it? Do we need to consider restrictions on the conditions under which data is collected, whether it's retained, whether it's on-sold, and so on? The fourth one, small acts matter. A lot of the projects I've showed you are relatively modest. They're temporary, small scale. But I think they're important in a number of ways. They're about experimenting with new models. So they're changing our idea about how we might think of using urban media, for instance. And they are also generating new experiences of urban exchange and encounter. And we learn through this experience. Final point, I'm saying embed artists in urban planning. This is a little bit of a provocation, really. It's really about the need for new kinds of collaboration, new kinds of knowledge when you're starting to combine material urban infrastructures with digital technology and new types of social experiences. You need to broaden the teams that are involved. So yes, it should involve designers, architects, planners, infrastructure engineers, but it also needs to involve computer scientists, it needs to involve data scientists, and I think it needs to involve artists, storytellers, geographers, sociologists, we see this kind of collaboration, this kind of interdisciplinarity happening a little bit, but it often comes at the end of the design process when we're interested in making the site beautiful. It needs to go the other way. It needs to happen at the beginning. It needs to be really embedded in that whole process as an integral part of it. Network public space, as I say, brings new challenges, but also new opportunities. And I think there's a real urgency to addressing them. If we think about nearness, which has its roots in the word neighbour, 
the quality of nearness was never simply about distance. This is something the philosopher Martin Heidegger recognized long ago. He said it's not a purely physical quality. It's more a quality that arises through practices of care. How do we maintain nearness in the context of geomedia and network public spaces? And the urgency is that the digitization of the city is happening now. It's the responsibility of us, of current generations. Because we know from history, once you embed systems in a city, like automobiles, it's really hard to change them 10, 20, 30 years down the track. So it's really important that we try and get the systems right now. What kind of future city do we want to inhabit? Do we want one that promotes mass surveillance in the name of security or targeted advertising? Or do we want to try and foster diverse forms of public communication as a vital aspect of the capacity for us as urban inhabitants to collectively redefine our own social spaces? Thank you very much.